Sounds good. Okay. So uh, welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm Rob Lehman, and I'm Associate Professor of English at Boston College and co-chair of the Mahindra Center Seminar in Dialectical Thinking here or here at, uh, at Harvard. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this symposium on Nathan Brown's recent book, A Rationalist Empiricism, A Theory of Speculative Critique, uh, which was published earlier this year by uh, Fordham University Press. Uh, Nathan Brown is Associate Professor of English, Canada Research Chair in Poetics, and Director of the Center for Expanded Poetics at Concordia University. He's also the author of The Limits of Fabrication, Material Science and Materialist Poetics, uh, also published by Fordham in 2017. And he has forthcoming in the fall a new translation of Baudelaire's uh, Les Fleurs du Mal, as well as a book-length critical study, Baudelaire's Shadow, an essay on poetic determination. But today we're focusing on, uh, on rationalist empiricism. I'm so happy to have been able to organize this event, uh, which will include responses to Nathan's book from Alexei Kukulyevich, Tracy McNulty, Nick Nesbitt, and Julia Ng. And I'm happy for a number of reasons. I've known Nathan for more than a decade, uh, since 2008, I think. And the time that I've known him has coincided uh, more or less with his composition of this book. Uh, and thinking back over the discussions, the arguments uh, that have defined this period in my own life and, and not just mine. And you know, looking at the screen, uh, you can see Audrey, Alexi, uh, Mike, and others. Uh, thinking back, I can't help but see in this book the articulation of and solution to a set of philosophical or theoretical problems that first began to seem unavoidable not long before I met Nathan. So problems concerning the relationship of philosophy to what Badiou would term its conditions, or problems concerning the co-determination of structure and genesis, or problems concerning the possibility of a movement beyond finitude that wouldn't simply ignore the philosophical sequence that reaches from Kant to Hegel and Derrida. I want to keep my remarks brief. And in any case, uh, through his careful readings of not only philosophy, but also politics, science, and art, Nathan does a better job, I think a much better job, of presenting these matters than I ever could. In reposing the question of the relationship between rationalism and uh, empiricism, and in doing so beyond the closure of the Kantian transcendental, he incites us to reconsider our understanding of so much from the history of philosophy, of the obscure concept of structure in Plato's Timaeus, the fact and method of separation in Marx's Capital, the exemplary exception in Hume's treatise and Descartes' Meditations. Uh, still more essentially, I think, he asks us to reconsider what it means to write the history of philosophy or to articulate the relationship of philosophy to history. And I'm increasingly convinced that among all of the other things that rationalist empiricism does, uh, this is where its most significant intervention as a book uh, is to be found. So Nathan is, is free to disagree. Uh, and if you've already, uh, if you've not already done so, I hope that the symposium today will inspire you to, uh, to read the book. Now, let me say something briefly about how this symposium will be organized. Uh, in this, the first session, there'll be two responses to Nathan's book. Uh, the first will come from Julia Ng. Uh, Julia is lecturer in critical theory and co-director of the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought at Goldsmiths University of London. She's most recently the co-editor and translator of Werner Homacher's Two Studies of Friedrich Holderlin, uh, which was published in 2020 and of a new critical edition of Walter Benjamin's Critique of Violence, forthcoming, I think, this June, uh, both from Stanford University Press. Uh, the second response will come from Nick Nesbitt. Uh, Nick is professor of French and Italian at Princeton and the author of a number of books, uh, the most recent being A Caribbean Critique, Antillian Critical Theory from Toussaint to Glissant, published by Liverpool in 2013. And there's another monograph forthcoming, I believe, uh, The Price of Slavery, uh, Capitalism, and Revolution in the Caribbean. Uh, he's also the editor of a number of books, including uh, The Concept in Crisis, Reading Capital Today, published by Duke in 2017, and with Jana Berenkova and Michael Hauser, uh, Revolutions for the Future, May 68 in the Prague Spring, both published by Suture in 2020. 
Uh, following Julia and Nick's responses, Nathan will have the opportunity to respond in turn. Then we'll open things up for Q&A, which can address both specific topics that have come up in the responses and rationalist empiricism more generally. So uh, with that, I think I will turn things over to Julia. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks, Rob, for uh, inviting me to um, be a part of this uh, symposium. And also thanks, Nathan, for writing this book, <laughs> which I've really had the pleasure of like reading, working through some of the ideas that have occupied me for a long time, sort of like in the air while working on a number of um, sort of tangential issues, I think. But um, let me just open my remarks. Um, by citing a really fantastic set of formulations that you can find at the end of chapter one. Quote, rationalist empiricism is not primarily concerned with the conditions of experience. It is the interruption of experience by reason and the extrapolation of reason from and yet beyond experience that is at issue in the rationalist methodological poll, while it is the experience of reason and also the exposure by empirical science of what cannot be experienced that is at issue in our empiricism. It is oriented toward the groundless manner in which reason and experience propel one another without achieving synthesis. There is doubtless something paradoxical about what Nathan Brown calls in the same passage an exteriority that is of an encounter which never took place and which therefore has to be constructed. And this is why he finds an apt description thereof in Quentin Mayasu's felicitous expression the paradox of manifestation. In Brown's reformulation, this is that through which the given marks that uh, makes manifest that which is refractory to givenness, that which could never have been and has never been given to manifestation, though its very subtra uh, subtraction from manifestation has been made manifest. In After Finitude, of course, Mayasu writes that the possibility of making scientific statements about a manifestation of the world, which is supposed to be anterior to any human form of the relation to the world, is due to the historical emergence of a conception of the mathematization of nature that renders meaningful thought's capacity to think what there is, whether thought exists or not. But Brown's project raises Mayasu's stakes. What if we were to subtract from this world? from which the necessity of its relation to us is already subtracted, also the need for the distinction between in itself and for us, even as a heuristic principle that makes meaningful the idea of a world without us, such that not even the stability of the referent in itself is left overturned and manifestation as such can be grasped as the form of the problem to hand. For those of us who work in what one, uh, what one might provisionally call the mathematical humanities, the audacity of this proposal strikes at the heart of the matter. It embraces the challenge of speaking of a world whose spatial temporal givenness comes to be given by virtue of the contingency of the very terms of its construction. Such terms range from the unity of the natural laws to the horizon, to the devices, numbers, and operations that take measurement and indeed symbolization itself. So a project that aims to dislodge the world as such from a forced conformity to the limits of reason, it's rich in implications for how we might rethink the relations between the present state of things and the reasons, rules, and other movements of intellection that organize and manipulate, manipulate such states. In short, a project that promises to transform how we think about transformation, namely as a problem of thinking through manifestation, a non-manifest world, is very much one I want to see come to fruition. As such, the remarks that follow are made in the spirit of inviting clarification and solidification of a couple of its key premises. I'll therefore focus my attention on the first chapter, where the methodological premises are laid out, by way of outlining the domain in which the promise of a rationalist empiricism first takes shape. It begins with a conviction arising from Alfred North Whitehead that, quote, philosophy is the self-correction by consciousness of its own initial excess of subjectivity. At issue, therefore, in any philosophical system, is a selectivity of interpretation that informs the determination of its concepts and schemata, 
Concomitantly, there arises the task of recovering the totality obscured by the selection and considering the extra systemic space we inevitably pass through when we cross systems in entering our experience into philosophical systematicity. This task would require us to somehow return critique to speculation without also asserting the need, reasserting the need for the transcendental subject. In other words, it is necessary to return to a pre-Kantian understanding of the relation between concept and experience. Hence the chapter's pursuit, which is articulated in a series of questions. Quote, what is the philosophical exception? How are we to think the mutual exteriority of philosophical exceptions? What happens when we encounter philosophical exceptions in their mutual exteriority, and when we invite them to encounter one another? This pursuit will discover its proper domain in a peculiar amalgamation of positions that after Kant are customarily treated as mutually suspicious of one another in virtue of transcendental subjectivity, namely Humean empiricism and Cartesian rationalism. Brown gives to this unique amalgamation the name exemplary exception. It, quote, inhabits an extra systemic yet intra philosophical space, unbounded by an envelope of conceptual systematicity yet determined in its contours by the edges of those philosophical systems that produce exteriorities by co constituting a field of internal co uh, coherence. And exemplary of these exemplary exceptions is what Brown calls absent blue wax, an anomalous entity co-determined by, on the one hand, the who absent from a spectrum of blues that contrary to his own epistemology, Hume believes the mind is capable of filling in. And on the other hand, the wax of the famous experiment that in his second meditation, Descartes permits himself just this once in order that his mind wander, or wander off into the perception of bodies, unrestrained within the bounds of truth before ultimately returning to confirm the priority of the intellect. What is striking though, is that Hume and Descartes are not equally co-determinant. Descartes seems to be more exemplary of the exemplary exception, as indicated by the way Brown presents his exemplarity. Quote, in the wax experiment, he writes, Descartes breaks with the order of reasons guiding his meditations, as Martial Guerroux argues, in order to deliver a verification of the priority of the intellect by professionally situating it in the opponent's point of view. The experiment is, accordingly, an anomalous empiricism through which we rediscover, so Guéroux, by another means, the conclusion obtained directly by following the genetic order of reasons. Derived initially from Guéroux's interpretation of Descartes, the order of reasons is then incorporated into Brown's own heuristic framework. For instance, in the way he reconstructs after finitude in chapter two. Indeed, the choice of Guéroux as the interpretation of Descartes that will exemplify pre-Kantian philosophical exception seems to involve motivations that perhaps have something more to do with the alignment of Guéroux with the structuralism and counter phenomenological stance associated with the celebrants, some of whom are also important for the project of rationalist empiricism, Althusser, Deleuze, et cetera. Thus, it is worth taking a closer look at what exactly the order of reasons entails and unpacking the specificity of Guéroux's interpretation of Descartes. The order of reasons is, first, a method that Guéroux develops for how to read Descartes, but it also derives from what Descartes says about his own method. As Descartes writes in his address to the readers of the meditations, quote, I should not advise anyone to read my book except those who intend to meditate seriously with me, but those who, without worrying much about the sequence and linkage of my reasons, amuse themselves with splitting hairs on each of the parts, as many do, those, I say, will not get much profit from reading this book. Citing this passage in his preface to Descartes' philosophy interpreted according to the order of rule of reasons, Guéroux, for his part, comments that, quote, we must therefore, above all, bear the order of reasons that is the sine qua non of the value of Descartes' doctrine in his own eyes. For, quote, the exact, exact restitution of this order, this return to Descartes' text, 
is what will allow us to settle the deep meaning of the doctrine and arrive at the unabridged historical truth and not the attribution of radical doubt to inferiority complexes and other psychoanalytical categories according to today's fashion, end quote. For some commentators, notably Knox Peden, Guerrero's insistence on interpreting Descartes according to the order of reasons should be understood in light of his altercation with Ferdinand Alquier, who had advanced his own reading of the discovery of the cogito as a result of, quote, an absence of certainty in the surrounding existent world. Reading Cartesian philosophy more ge uh, geometrico and as demonstrative of his own truth, Guerrero was therefore in this view, turning Descartes into a Spinozist aligned with the structuralism of the 1960s. But what if Guerrero's Descartes were not solely definable in terms of this altercation with uh, Alquier or with the lens of the Spinozist rationalist tradition one is already committed to identifying in the 1960s st uh, structuralism? According to Mogens Lerke, for instance, Guerrero called structural analysis a principle of philosophical history that was concerned with conditions of possibility of the discipline already in the 1920s. This, otherwise called dion uh, dionomatics, might thus have more in common with late 19th century historiography and neo-Kantianism and what Guerrero himself termed a radical idealism, that is to say, a positive affirmation of the reality and self-sufficiency of all systems based on the fact of the existence of past philosophical works. By extension, the order of reasons is not Guerrero's own invention of an a priori principle of philosophical history, a notion that his dianomatics outright rejects but rather his interpretation of a unique way of understanding the meditations as self-verifying and as established by Descartes himself. In this light, a crucial dimension of Guerrero's characterization of Descartes' wax experiment becomes legible. Guerrero proceeds through the second meditation geometrically, that is, according to the internal linkages between its truths. I exist as a thinking being, my nature is no other than pure thought and pure intelligence. I know myself, my existence, and my essence, while my body is canceled by the evil genius and remains unknown to me. Therefore, body is less easily known than soul. To overcome the lingering power of common sense definitively, however, Descartes provisionally situates the mind in the opponent's position and examines one of the objects that appear to be outside in order to verify by, quote, by another means that bodies are known insofar as they are understood by thought. Guerrero's appraisal of the indirect means, however, is that, quote, the more faculties through which I know problematically the existence of bodies, and the more faculties that allow me to know immediately and in all certainty that I exist, the more faculties I can relate to myself as its own modes. The more ways I picture myself as knowing bodies, the better I know myself. This is quoting Guerrero. Particularly, this final sentence seems key. Guerrero emphasizes the iterative, cumulative character of the so-called synthetic order, as described by Descartes. Synthetic order may be indirect, but it and the imagination that it involves contribute to better knowledge of self which as a consequence is richer and more distinct. Certain knowledge of myself is therefore infinitely richer than uncertain knowledge of bodies, but the increasing richness of knowledge of oneself derives from the increasing ways of problematically knowing bodies. Thus, however much the end affirms the priority of the intellect over the imagination, the imagination also enriches and strengthens, Gilles words, the order of reasons and is reversed he says, rather than abolished outright, making the scenario, according to Guerrero himself, rather less analogous to the Kantian sublime and its so-called subtractive method than perhaps Husserl's second Cartesian meditation. There, Husserl replaces the wax with a multi-sided die, which pictures, quote, giving the same being continuously as an objective unity in a multiform and changeable multiplicity of manners of appearing, flowing away in the unity of a synthesis so as to disclose the facts of synthetic structure through the temporality imminent to its modes of givenness. Indeed, the dye's substitution for the wax itself references the wax substitutability 
as such for Husserl in the intentional act, uh, object's first formal logical or formal ontological sense. In this initial sense, the intentional object stands in for, quote, the anything whatever, which makes present in fantasy the uh, potential pot uh, perceptions that would make the invisible visible and so bring also the potential implicit and pre-delineated subjective processes in the sense producing intentionality of the actual ones into the field comprising the objective sense of the cogitatum in question. And this I take to be analogous to Guéraud's surprising concession to what he calls, quote, the true indestructibility of the wax that, quote, remains the same as a substance for us precisely through an experience of the temporality imminent to its modes of givenness, i.e. hot, liquid, or solid. Now, this is important because it indicates how, for Guéraud, reading Descartes according to the order of reason seems to lead directly to an unexpected acknowledgement of the irreducibility of the imagination, and therefore to its non-abolition. And this perhaps in spite of himself, as the first chapter of his Descartes book does not hesitate to rehearse the narrative, in currency since the end of the 19th century, that modern rationalism was born from a radical shift of perspective attributed to its first heroes, Descartes and Leibniz, and their shared project of the Mathesis Universalis. From the beginning, Guerreau writes, quote, Cartesianism was engaged in an effort to construct a complete system of certain knowledge, at once both metaphysical and scientific, a system fundamentally different from the Aristotelian one, because it is wholly eminent in the mathematical certainty embodied in the clear and distinct intellect, but no less complete and even stricter in its need for absolute rigor. Yet, just a few pages later, Guéroul notes that Descartes warned his readers not to delve too deeply into metaphysics alone at the expense of deploying the understanding together with the imagination, which he admits is necessary for mathematics and physics. Though he then also adds that Descartes is not to be taken too seriously on such statements. Whatever else might be said about Guéraud's ambivalence, perhaps the historian in him could not help but distinguish between Cartesianism and Descartes. This much seems certain. The modern rationalism associated with universal mathematics, typified by a mathematical practice that presents itself as innovative, and associated with an algebraization of geometry that purportedly brought an end to the imagination is itself a modern narrative with ties to neo-Kantian historiography. Were one to consider contemporaneous mathematical practice and discovers that the imagination plays a central role in Descartes and mathematics, not just in a representative or semantic sense, but as a material proxy onto which reason projects and manipulates basic mathematical relations and which can genuinely carry inferences. Cartesian extension can express relations between magnitudes and thus any perceived state of affairs because of the imagination and its ability to see mathematical proportions and ratios. Algebraic symbolization merely supplements this process by abbreviating and making manipulable more complex problems. Similarly, one could say, the infinitely changing aspect of the wax of the second meditation is too complex for the imagination to sufficiently treat in present attention, thus indexing a discordance between imagination and concept, though not yet the elimination of the former. Importantly, what's innovated here is not the supremacy of the intellect over imagination, but rather the idea that the geometric imagination can therefore not function as a representation, if understood as a form of semantic relation. As David Rabouin has argued, diagrams are in certain, for instance, reductio proofs, necessarily based on impossible configurations. That is, they can serve an analytic end even when we do not know in advance whether they represent a possible state of affairs or not. Sometimes the work of imagination is used to show how a mathematical situation is not possible and is used because it does not represent a genuine mathematical situation. And it can do so precisely because they involve manipulating material inscriptions and thus thinking with a specific body 
They are proxies with which we reason because they describe a material structure onto which meaning is projected. Which brings me to my conclusion. Rationalist empiricism asks that we return to a pre-Kantian framework for constructing the relation between concept and experience as an encounter that never took place. As I have suggested, it therefore demands that we rid ourselves of the obstructive 19th century narrative that attaches the birth of modern rationalism to a discovery of the formal at the expense of imagination that is attributed to Descartes' so-called so invention of a purely formalized approach to matters geometrical. What this entails is that we distinguish between pre-Kantian Descartes and 20th century interpretations of Descartes, a distinction that in turn asks that we hold open the possibility that the wax in the experiment is a material proxy for the mind's self-enrichment via a cumulative imaginative process and that the wax experiment is neither an empirical demonstration per se, nor knowledge or understanding of the body in general. What if the wax experiment were a material proxy? Can the, quote, imminent critique of empiricism that Brown identifies in the second meditation not be undertaken by something other than the really empirical, such as, for instance, a proxy for empiricism, situated prior to the purported historical emergence of a mathesis universalis, that is taken to render meaningful thought's capacity to think what there is, whether thought exists or not. What if rationalist empiricism were accomplished precisely by a detour through the imagination, its project of thinking through manifestation, a non-manifest world achieved in the proxy's hybrid material conceptual universe? Such a detour repre uh, presents an alternative to the familiar story that philosophical and scientific modernity emerges from the discovery of abstraction at the cost of materiality and sense, a story that demands that the European scientific, uh, scientific revolution be placed at its singular apex, apex. By contrast, redirecting through imagination's hybrid universe would suspend the need for the idea of a world without us to be meaningful for us at all, yet without also abdicating the possibility for the world without us to also be meaningful without us. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. And at uh, this time, I will uh, hand it over to uh, Professor Nick Nesbitt. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Nathan. And. Uh, Julia and Tracy, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, I uh, have, Nathan and I haven't met yet in person. Uh, we, in fact, just met pretty recently over Facebook where I would follow among other things, his choices of LPs that he was spinning day to day. We started conversing about that and one thing led to another and I got a hold of this wonderful new book. And uh, from some exchanges we had, here we are today. And it's really a pleasure for me to, uh, to be a part of this discussion. I learned so much from the book itself. And there's so many things to talk about, but we don't have unlimited time. So I'm only going to focus on one question I have, which is about the, the, the place of empiricism in the book itself. Uh, so let me, just, let me just begin then. The commanding theoretical intervention of rationalist empiricism is to have demonstrated across the broad arc of post-Kantian theory and in the context of post-Althusserian materialism in particular, the productive tension between these two categories, rationalism and empiricism, at the very limits of the thinking of ontological difference. There's so much that I've taken from the book from the incisive clarity of its critiques of Kant and Hegel to the discerning development of Comte Meassou's intervention after and in critical dissonance with speculative realism. But here in the brief space of our discussion, I wanna focus on the crucial dimension of the book that's of particular interest to me, that is its elaboration of the Althusserian reading of Marx's Capital. So if you don't mind, I just have a few slides as we go, just some 
a few qu brief quotes in counterpoint to what I'm saying. Let me see if it'll come up here. Uh, Is that working, Rob? Okay. So I wanna push back just a bit against Nathan's repeated and repeatedly suggestive invocations of empiricism to propose that rationalist empiricism in the culminating moments of its most elaborate developments repeats a gesture, a gesture that for me marks a hesitation or at least one that invites further demonstration and discussion. By this, I want to propose that these imposing readings of Meassou, of Kant, Hegel, Althusser, Marx, Badiou, in each case culminate in the determination of what I think is truly a novel theoretical concept that the book nonetheless, I'd say, hesitates to name. In each case, instead, problematically, for me at least, reiterating the concept of empiricism. This reiteration of empiricism for all of its real sophistication marks uh, for me, as, as I say, a puzzling and persistent reappearance at these heights of theoretical sophistication of a dualism of subject and object of the concrete and the immaterial of phenomenon and nomenon. Instead, this concept rationalist empiricism constructs yet hesitates to name, I would call a rationalist materialism. Now, to be sure, rationalist empiricism refuses to limit the notion of empiricism to the mere definition it receives in every philosophical dictionary is the assertion that all knowledge arises from sensuous experience, whether for cl uh, classically for Hume, or as what Nathan rightly calls the vulgar empiricism of Mill or Lenin, I would say Lenin, that takes, quote, takes the objects of scientific practice to be pure phenomena that have not undergone a process of either ideological or theoretical transformation, unquote. The book does initially define empiricism along similar lines as, quote, a philosophical orientation claiming the genesis of ideas in experience, unquote. It proceeds, however, above all in its acute analysis of Meassu's thesis to develop a provocative yet to me still confounding no notion of empiricism delinked from any governing debt to psychological apperception. Without attending to the many subtle intricacies of the argument on Meassu, however, already I'll pose to Nathan the question that delimits my intervention. Why still call Meassu's position one that asserts, quote, as Nathan writes, the capacity of mathematics to formalize physical properties so as to subtract them from their sensory correlates, unquote. Why call this an empiricism, even a rationalist empiricism? So I wanna suggest maybe a bit polemically, the theoretical incongruence of Althusser's two positions from 1965 and 1966, positions rationalist empiricism crucially invokes at various points in its demonstration, those of an Althusser at the peak of his theoretical powers of insight in the pages of genius, I, I think, cast with Rimbaldian clairvoyance in the introduction to reading capital, that is to say, versus a constitutionally weakened, theoretically ambivalent Althusser just a year later embroiled in the debates with Gaudi, Aragon, and theory and practice, under attack by the PCF for his so-called theoreticism, the theoreticism of reading capital, in what for me is maybe a minor essay in which Althusser somewhat weakly asserts this reductive conflation of a line of thought that he names uh, rationalist empiricism. So while Althusser is clearly in this later essay, making a broadly inclusive point about the history of French epistemology, to place as he does the proper name of Jean Cavalles next to that of Bachelard, I think obscures a materialist anti-empiricist intervention that Cavalles initiates in his call to theoretical struggle. The famous final lines of his 1942 philosophical testament, 
Cavallese's, now finally translated into English on logic and the theory of science. In those last lines, second to last lines, Cavallese writes, it's not a philosophy of consciousness, but a philosophy of the concept that can yield a doctrine of science. In contrast to Bachelard's experimentalist empiricism, Cavallese initiates a philosophical orientation attentive to the historical determinations of the criteria governing adequate demonstration, in which the formal signs or marks of logic are taken to constitute an asubjective history of mathematics. Cavallestes calls for a notion of mathematics and scientific development more generally, in general, not just of mathematics, that follows the internal development of its concepts rather than a dualist model of the adequation of an empirical object to its mathematical formalization. Cavallese invokes in this manner an apodictic philosophy of the concept, a dialectic that displaces the philosophy of consciousness to demonstrate the, quote, internal necessity determining the apodictic development of a science. Though Cavallese's debt to Spinoza is as decisive as it is elusive, he only mentions Spinoza once or twice in, in uh, really in his whole in his whole work and in on logic just once, I think. And the object of his writings uh, remained devoted, Cavallese's remained devoted entirely to the philosophy of mathematics in which of course the domain of internal necessity governs most evidently. Still, Althusser, uh, who was a close reader of Cavallese and of on logic, will in the introduction to reading capital simultaneously bring together the thought of Spinoza and Cavallese while expanding their materialist propositions to encompass, to encompass the non-mathematical science of Marx's critique of political economy. This Spinozist materialism, which Althusser will argue governs Marx's methodological introduction, the 1857 text uh, uh, at the beginning of the Grundrisse, uh, refuses the dualist empiricist logic of the adequation of an object to its concept to assert instead a single order and connection of all things, including ideas, grasped under the attributes of extension or thought or any other attribute. Following Althusser in his reading of Marx's 1857 introduction and in his own introduction to Reading Capital, the materialist conclusion that I think we have to draw from this Spinozist Cavallesian epistemology is that the material thought concrete, what Marx calls the Gedanken concretum, this thought concrete that Marx will eventually construct, that is the unfinished book that is capital, Das Kapital, is not analytically or inductively extracted from any supposed experimental observations of capitalism, but simply is capitalism. The book Capital is capitalism, grasped insofar as it's adequate, as, uh, and yet it's of course an unfinished project, but insofar as it's adequate in its demonstration, Das Kapital is capitalism grasped under the attribute of thought rather than in its physical extension, the physical extension of the social form of capitalism. Spinoza in the famous scolium to uh, book two, proposition seven of the ethics, refuses any empiricist notion of the adequation of the object to the idea as an index of truth to assert instead the adic that adequate knowledge of a thing as knowledge can be demonstrated only through deduction via the attribute of thought rather than, an, than in abstraction from observed empirical extension. Marx's capital in this view is exactly what its subtitle names, a critique of political economy, a radical reworking of the substantial ideas forged by the tradition of thought from Smith and Ricardo onward, ideas such as value of money, of labor, et cetera, 
Althusser puts the matter decisively, quote, no mathematician in the world waits until physics has verified a theorem to declare it proved, although whole areas of mathematics are applied in physics. The truth of his theorem is 100% provided by criteria purely internal to the practice of mathematical proof, hence by the criterion of mathematical practice. This, is, this quote is just one of the many passages, I think, in the introduction to Reading Capital where Althusser is channeling more or less unacknowledged Spinoza and, and especially Cavalles. So let me pause back up again in order to move decisively to the ultimate object of my remarks, the apodictic positive dialectic and logic of demonstration that determines, I want to argue, Marx's capital as a materialist intervention in thought in a dialectic otherwise than empiricist. To do so, I want to return then to this confounding ambivalence I invoked in the beginning of my remarks between what I see as two conflicting moments or moments in tension in rationalist empiricism's readings of Althusser and Marx. First, on the one hand, there's Althusser's lucid 1965 refusal of uh, Hegelian negative dialectical readings of capital, the theoretical call to arms, in other words, of reading capital that rightly stands as the epigraph of uh, Nathan's brilliantly original reading of capital as a logic of separation. That's in the beginning of chapter 10. In capital, we find a systematic presentation and apodictic arrangement of the concepts uh, in the form of that type of demonstrational discourse that Marx calls analysis. This is explicitly to name the Spinozist Cavayesian positive dialectic that governs reading capital uh, that governs reading capital polemically argues Marx's non-Hegelian methodology of synthetic demonstration. In contrast to the resonant iconoclastic force of this epigraph, a resounding silence in the book, uh, uh, a silence that's surprising, I think, as it's not merely that, as Nathan writes, although Althusser deploys the term rationalist materialism to characterize an, interior, an entire tradition, he doesn't often characterize his own epistemology in such terms. Rather, I think it's the case that in the introduction to reading Capital, from just a year before, Althusser articulates an encompassing and unyielding critique of empiricism, in which, indeed, Althusser explicitly names as among his targets the concept that gives this book, its titular concept, rationalist empiricism, not merely content to confront the familiar and perhaps more vulnerable concept of sensualist empiricism, Althusser formulates his critique of, quote, the empiricist conception of knowledge in novel fashion, taking the term, he writes, quote, in its widest sense, since it can embrace a rationalist empiricism as well as essentialist empiricism. This is reading capital. Althusser's critical notion of empiricism is all the more surprising since you know, one would expect Althusser simply to have based his critique on Spinoza's familiar claim in the famous appendix to book one of the ethics of, uh, for the radical inadequacy of all thought derived from sensory impressions in its necessary movement from observed effects backwards it, that is inadequately to their imaginary ideological causes. <clears throat> That's what I would expect. One would expect Althusser to go to. Instead, Althusser identifies an entirely different, different criterion that he'll contrast with Marx's materialist method in Capital. And so in these passages that are as famous as they are absent from rationalist empiricism, Althusser claims instead that, quote, the whole empiricist process of knowledge lies in fact in an operation of the subject called abstraction. To know is to abstract the real uh, object from the real object, its essence. This initial formulation already casts empiricism in all its variants as a dualist relation of subject to object, a conception of knowledge production that Althusser then contrasts with Marx's Spinozist thought concrete that reproduces 
as opposed to merely representing the material extensive real of the capitalist social form, capitalism itself, that is to say, in the attribute of thought. So Althusser then takes a further step in this general critique of empiricism to draw a necessary implication of uh, this empiricist extraction of the essential truth from an object. In all empiricist operations, he then asserts, in both its sensualist uh, and rationalist variants, the sole function of knowledge, he says, is to separate in the object the two parts that exist in it, the essential and the inessential, to eliminate the inessential real. So, of course, Althusser is making a big, broad claim about all empiricism. I want to just focus on Marx and, and capital, however. And so whatever we'd make of these claims regarding the nature of empiricism, any empiricism whatsoever, and I'm expecting, I'm hoping, I'm looking forward to Nathan maybe pushing back against the broad stroke of Althusser's brush here. But in the case of Marx's capital, I think Althusser makes a really compelling claim. For a real distinction should be drawn between the empiricist methods, say, of Adam Smith and Marx's Spinozist materialism in capital. Smith, to take a famous example, recall, begins the wealth of nations with the assertion of a universal notion, inductively abstracted from the observed regularities of human communities in general. Transhistorically, these constitute the basic anthropological features that need only in this view, in Smith's view, naturally come to flourish once the historical impediments to trade of previous social forms, agrarian, feudal, et cetera, were lifted. There exists, Smith writes in the first paragraph, quote, a certain propensity of human nature, propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. It's common to all men and to be found in no other race of animals, unquote. And I think furthermore, Althusser's point is well taken since not only does Smith appear to derive this universal notion from empirical abstraction, but he furthermore deploys it in the next paragraphs to discern an essential characteristic of human behavior from other inessential qualities common to human and animal species, he mentions passions, acting in concert, et cetera. Marx, in contrast, does something, I think, significantly greater than merely demystify the illusory nature of the various phenomenal features of capitalism. These include concepts such as commodity fetishism, money, profit, freedom of so-called freedom of the wage labor contract, the illusions of a supposedly virtuous and benevolent priv primitive accumulation, the Trinity formula, profit, land, rent, wages, you know, there are many, many others. But in every case, Marx doesn't simply dismiss these as inessential features of capitalism in a contrast to more essential categories that he discovers like abstract labor, labor power, surplus value. Instead, in this Spinozist fashion that Althusser's gesturing toward, he rigorously demonstrates in every case the systematic necessity that governs each ca category in, of the capitalist social form, including its superficial forms of appearance. So in addition to mere negative critique, capital produces also a positive theory of ideology and its forms of appearance. So let me move to my conclusion. Uh, I wanna just draw together very quickly these strands of my argument around the status of Marx's capital as in Althusser's words, a systematic presentation, an apodictic arrangement of the concepts. I have to say, I remain somewhat unconvinced by Nathan's assertion that the concept of separation constitutes not only a crucial category for Marx, which obviously rationalist empiricism very powerfully and novelly uh, demonstrates, but furthermore, the argument that it, quote, provides an analytical method to be gleaned from the structure of capitalism that formalizes the dialectical logic of this double mediation, unquote. It's still, to me, it's still not entirely clear, having read the chapter several times, exactly how separation 
constitutes a method for apodictic demonstration of the nature of the capitalist social form as the well-chosen epigraph to the chapter implies it must. So I'd be glad to hear from Nathan more on that claim. In any case, I find it maybe even more difficult to accept the claim that's, I think, generic to the entire thrust of rationalist empiricism that, quote, Marx discovers his method through an empirical study of what's already there, the history and structure of the capitalist mode of production, unquote. Marx, I think, painstakingly derives his method not from empirical observation, say, of markets or factories or interviews with laborers or debates in the first international. I think Marx developed his method by critically inquiring into the theoretical writings of political economy and of nascent socialism. And he largely did so sitting in the British library, say, or at his desk. There weren't any experimental empiricist data for him to interpret. I think not even the famous parliamentary reports, the blue books, those late editions of chapter 15 that Marx put in in 1865 or 66. I think those supplementary pages are, are detailing the mere quantitative fluctuations of price, the price of labor power amid the historical dynamic of class struggle. Instead, Marx asked a far more fundamental question in the whole is the basis of capital. What is the law or what are the laws of the tendencies and the social form governing these empirical quantitative fluctuations? So while his vast biographical experience with the world of 19th century capitalism, of course, informed his critical orientation, and was decisive in his political writings, the empiricist dimension of the initial inquiries for capital, the Grundrisse, that is to say, and the decades of painstaking drafting and revision from 1859 to just before his death in 1883 is arguably limited uh, to his uh, tired eyes, Marx's tired eyes, scouring the markings across thousands, even millions of sheets of paper. I'm trying to get out of my slideshow here. Um, there we go. Okay. So there are many more things to say about Nathan's monumental contribution to contemporary theory. And so let me just end by proposing that capital today has to be read as Althusser and Machere first maintained as a logic, not as Althusser quickly corrects as, quote, logicians, which would have meant posing it the question of its methods of exposition and proof, unquote. In other words, as a mere discursive, logical, positivist word game, but as the Spinozist materialist logic of the necessary forms of appearance of things in the capitalist social form. This would mean, I think, remaining faithful to the unfulfilled promise of reading capital. To pursue this project of discerning in capital a positive synthetic demonstration, a, pod, a project disbanded in the wake of May 68, pursued only obliquely on other terrains, above all by Machere via Spinoza and by Dieu in his reconstruction of logic. And Rationalist empiricism is brilliant in, for me in the way that it distinguishes Hegel's logic, both from the psychological, psycho psychologistic assertion of the I think as the subject and experience of thought, as well as from Kantian transcendental apperception, the unity of apperception, to show, however, that Hegel, that the logic remains an idealist logic, such that, quote, being cannot be thought independently of thinking or as external to thinking. If then we're to think capital as a logic with rationalist empiricism, as a rationalist materialism, capitalism, capital constitutes a materialist rejection of Hegelian idealism in this sense. It's neither a metaphysics nor an ontology. It reproduces as a thought concrete in positive dialectical form, the structural logic governing the necessary forms of appearance of things 
in a historically so specific social form. It is what uh, Badiou says in his refoundation and delimitation uh, in logics of worlds, the science of appearance, but not the science of appearance of any world in general, as Badiou argues in logics of worlds, but the necessary forms of appearance and relations of objects in a given world, precisely Marx's project in Capital. And so anyway, that'll be the book that I'm writing now under the influence of rationalist empiricism on the Spinoza's logic of capital. But for now, I'm just gonna listen to everyone else and then reread rationalist empiricism for the pleasure of it. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much to Julia and, and Nick uh, for these responses. Thanks to Rob for organizing this event and for the wonderful introduction. And I can say that Rob is, is truly um, one of the people who uh, was most important as an interlocutor in the genesis of this book. And that's why the conclusion on the true, the beautiful and the good um, is, is dedicated to him, uh, thanks to many of our conversations about, about Kant. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming. Uh, this response, I think, will be about 25 minutes. Um, so again, thanks to both Julie and Nick uh, for these productive responses, both of which exemplify what I think is at the core of critique as a philosophical disposition. That is, the demand for clarification, the perpetual exposure of philosophical thinking and writing to the Kantian question, quid juris. And in my view, it's the speculative vocation of critique that gives this question its strongest properly philosophical form. What is the necessity according to which you say what you say? Why does this have to be said of what happens in thought? That question is the unavoidable criterion of philosophical argumentation, which as Descartes rightly held, must be clear and distinct, even as it leads us into formidable challenges to common sense. So let me begin by returning to the passage cited at the beginning of Julia's reply, since I want to take seriously the possibility that uh, descriptions uh, like uh, fantastic or paradoxical or peculiar um, may not be entirely laudatory. Um, and I think it might be useful to try to clarify the bearing of paradox upon rationalist empiricism and also upon speculative critique. So if paradox means contrary to received opinion or expectation, then what it names is essential to philosophy, the critique of doxa, and the refusal of common sense as a criterion of genuine thinking. But if paradox means a proposition or statement that is taken to be, or actually is, self-contradictory, absurd, or intrinsically unreasonable, then the term carries real critical force, since coherence is indeed the indispensable criterion of philosophy. Thus paradox itself has a paradoxical relation to philosophy in a rigorous sense. It is constitutive of philosophy as that which goes beyond doxa, and it is destructive of philosophy as that which undermines coherence. So these two senses of the term uh, contradict one another or contrast with one another. These two senses of paradox run alongside and agitate the history of philosophy. A speculative thinking requires a critique of doxa and the criterion of coherence demands a critique of merely dogmatic speculation. My claim is that it is the disjunctive relation between rationalism untethered from transcendental grounding that enables us a uh, disjunctive relation between rationalism and empiricism untethered from transcendental grounding that enables us to hold the imperatives of speculation and critique accountable to one another preventing critique from falling back into common sense or speculation into incoherence. So let me try to clarify um, what I mean by the formulations quoted at the beginning of Julia's response, since doing so will bring out some key elements of the book. So here's the, uh, the passage. It is the interruption of reason by experience and the extrapolation of reason from and yet beyond experience that is at issue in the rationalist methodological poll while it is the experience of reason and also the exposure by empirical science of what cannot be experienced 
that is at issue in our empiricism. So that's from, from my book. So let me unpack this. By the experience of reason, I refer to Hegel's methodological concept of Erfahrung, particularly in the science of logic, where the taking place and the recollection of pure thinking is itself the content of experience, an experience of reason unfolding its imperatives through operations of distinction, negation, preservation, which amount to the determinacy and actuality of thinking. This is how we can make sense of Hegel's statement that, quote, uh, the true critique of the determinations of thought must proceed not according to the abstract form of the a priori as contrasted with the a posteriori, but in themselves according to their particular content. That's from the logic. Mm -hmm. Refusing the philosophical terminology of the, a, of the a priori, while nevertheless restricting one's investigations to the domain of pure thinking, is paradoxical in the first sense. True critique sets out from a critique of a methodological doxa, the opposition of the a priori and the a posteriori. But it is not paradoxical in the second sense of absurdity because Hegel shows the coherence of rejecting that opposition by traversing the experience of reason and demonstrating the rationality of his method of imminent critique. Hegel is taken to be, and sometimes takes himself to be, a critic of the principle of non-contradiction, but in fact, his dialectical method obeys it. When there is a contradiction, there is a negation, and this is the very movement of the concept, the movement of determinate negation that composes the content of thinking. It's only the figure of the whole that imposes real contradiction upon Hegel's thought, since the very concept of the whole is the totality of contradictions. Thus, the principle of non-contradiction imposes upon us a criterion for sustaining the coherence of Hegel's thought against his own program. The process of true critique requires an unbinding of truth from the whole. Now, what do I mean when I say it is the exposure by empirical science of what cannot be experienced that is at issue in our empiricism? Here I refer, as Nick puts it, to a notion of empiricism delinked from any governing debt to psychological apperception. Science determines that which is refractory to human cognition and phenomenal receptivity through instruments and experimental procedures incorporating and testing formalizations and theories under conditions of givenness constructed in a manner exterior to our experience. Finally, I characterize the rationalist pole of my framework in terms of, quote, the interruption of experience by reason and the extrapolation of reason from and yet beyond experience. Theoretical physics, for example, constantly surpasses the availability of experimental data, yet it does so by setting out from and going beyond the history of science and its relation to mathematics. Moreover, it's often the experimental identification of anomalies or problems in the present state of physical theory that forces the speculative extrapolations of theoretical physics, leading to the revisions of theoretical frameworks themselves. But there's also an interruption of experience by reason proper to philosophical rationalism um, rather than uh, to science, uh, which Quentin Mayassou formulates as follows in his dissertation, so quoting the dissertation. The canonical paradox of rationality is thus given in this form. Reason presents itself as universal discursivity, necessary and true, thus as the thought of that which is, but that which is given is particular and contingent. If reason is not a chimera, then it must resolve this problem, how to disengage at the heart of the factual beings given an experience, that which adequate to those beings, is not itself contingent. What's important here is that Mayasu is not an axiomatic thinker since he recognizes that any system of axioms is itself contingent. Spinoza's axioms are predicated upon canonical scholastic definitions, but you decides among axiomatic frameworks available in set theory. Setting out from the contingency of what is the case, Mayasu asks how we can arrive at anything that has to be said, that's necessary. And what he tries to show in a section of the dissertation that I've translated, and it's published in, in Parisia, is that the only thing that cannot be thought as contingent, as contingent is contingency itself. Because this redoubling of contingency to say contingency is contingent is incoherent. His argument is thus that the principle of sufficient reason is itself irrational and that the ultimate ground 
required by that principle cannot be coherently thought. Thus, the preservation of philosophical rationality requires the renunciation of the principle of sufficient reason. And this paradox, because it does indeed defy rationalist doxa, not only can be rigorously thought, but it upholds the criterion of reason against the incoherence of self-contradiction. So let me turn now to the question of the wax experiment. <clears throat> and as Julia rightly, rightly notes, I position the wax experiment as an, exp uh, an empiricist exception to Descartes' methodological suspension of reference to sense experience. And on this part, on this point, I cite, uh, sorry, and on this point, I cite Marcel Guerreau's argument that Descartes thus attempts to quote, deliver a verification of the priority of the intellect by provisionally taking up the opponent's point of view. But my reading of the wax experiment is not at all derived initially from Guerreau nor does my account ultimately correspond with his interpretation, since the conclusions I draw go beyond his approach to this episode in the second meditation. Rather, my understanding of the wax experiment as a methodological exception is indeed drawn directly from Descartes' unambiguous description of it as exactly that. He writes, but my mind enjoys wandering off and will not yet submit to being restrained within the bounds of truth. Very well then, just this once, let us give it free reign so that after a while, when it is time to tighten the reins, it may more readily submit to being curbed. Through my critique of Michel Henry's reading of the wax experiment, in which he argues that the second meditation's problematic develops entirely within an attitude of reduction, I aim to show that phenomenological reduction is exactly what is suspended. And this is what makes the experiment a methodological exception. Against Henri, I argue that the whole point of this exception is indeed attention to a particular body, one body in particular, Descartes says, rather than simply an analysis of knowledge of bodies in general. Attributing my approach to Descartes to Guerreau, Julia develops an alternative interpretation of Guerreau's interpretation, which is meant to sustain and to foreground, quote, an unexpected acknowledgement of the irreducibility of the imagination and therefore it's non-abolition. But what's strange here is that this is exactly the account of the wax experiment that I offer in my chapter. So I'm in agreement with this suggestion, though I think we differ with respect to its significance. Tracing the temporality of Descartes' experiment, I write that, quote, we arrive at the insufficiency of the imagination to grasp an immeasurable, num an immeasurable number of changes in their temporal unfolding and we thereby accede to the power of the intellect to determine the supersensible identity of the wax. This is an exposition of Descartes' argument. But I do not mean to minimize the role of imagination in the wax experiment, nor to abolish it. On the contrary, not only do I affirm the important role played by the imagination, I make that role the basis for a reinterpretation of the Cartesian subject. Deleuze attributes to Kant the insight that the subject can only be, quote, my undetermined existence, uh, sorry, um, that yeah, Deleuze attributes to Kant the insight that the subject can only be, my undetermined existence can, can only be determined within time as the existence of a phenomena, of a passive receptive phenomenal subject appearing within time. And he puts this interpretation of, of Kant forward as a critique of the atemporal punctual constitution of the Cartesian subject. My argument is that, quote, in the Cartesian wax experiment, we already encounter such a subject. And moreover, I describe the temporal unfolding of the wax experiment as, quote, a retroactive genesis of the cogito irreducible to its initial formulation. So while I acknowledge that the point of Descartes' experiment is to recover the stability of the intellect from the insufficiency of the imagination to an innumerable number of changes, this is the parallel I draw with the Kantian sublime, the point of my argument is that something irreducible and also exterior to the phenomenological reduction has taken place in the interval of the experiment. This is what Descartes himself fails to foreground. He says, I see that without any effort, I have now finally got back where I wanted. And I counter that as follows, uh, quoting from the chapter, but in the interim, we have quietly plunged into the chasm in the depths of the subject that Kant will explore some 140 years after Descartes and that Deleuze will excavate nearly 200 years after Kant. Uh, 
So I do not want to diminish the role of the imagination as the, the faculty of temporal synthesis in the wax experiment. But the stakes of the distinction between our perspective on the significance of this reading are probably at issue uh, in the reference in Julia's reply to Husserl's second Cartesian meditation. Because Husserl does, unlike Descartes, operate entirely within the attitude of reduction. And what this means is that the cogito then cannot undergo an ungrounding of the transcendental unity of apperception through the exteriority of the time of the object to the time of consciousness. And what I think is implicitly at issue in the Kantian sublime, and this is following Deleuze's argument, is an incommensurability between the time and space of the subject and the time and space of exteriority, which requires one to dislodge the transcendental circum circumscription of time and space, and to think the way in which subjective synthesis comes into contact with an exteriority that exceeds it. Julia writes that, quote, rationalist empiricism asks that we return to a pre-Kantian framework for constructing the relation between concept and experience as an encounter that never took place. But while my chapter is dedicated to pre-Kantian philosophers, the framework that I develop in the rest of the book is emphatically not pre-Kantian, but rather post-Hegelian, a framework responsive to Hegel's critique of Kant and to Heidegger's reading of Kant, as well as to critiques of Hegel by Marx and Heidegger and Althusser and Meissou. My effort in chapter one is also more poetic than programmatic, and it relies upon an act indeed of philosophical imagination, um, an attempt to figure the relational disjunction of rationalism and empiricism, their extra systemic mingling as an imaginary object, absent blue wax, that may be held only in the mind's eye. So turning to Nick's response, um, let me try to clarify my position on the relation between materialism and rationalist empiricism, which I take to be at the core of his intervention. From my perspective, there can be no distinction between rationalist materialism and rationalist empiricism. We can't decide between these two as if they were uh, opposing alternatives. My position is that in order for post-Kantian philosophy to be materialist, it must be both rationalist and empiricist. If we consider two major divisions structuring the philosophical field, one between rationalism and empiricism, two between materialism and idealism, my position is that sustaining a methodological tension between rationalism and empiricism is the post-Kantian uh, post criterion for holding materialism apart from idealism. So the distinction between materialism and idealism can only be upheld by a disjunctive relation between rationalism and empiricism. That's the argument. To put it negatively, there can be no rationalist materialism that is not a rationalist empiricism. So that's my perspective on this issue. Let me try to defend it. Uh, why? To put it as succinctly as possible, because materialism depends upon the exposure of thinking to the exteriority of being. Materialism is indeed a philosophy of the outside, of the encounter of thinking with that which is exterior to thought. This is the sine qua non of the distinction of materialism from both transcendental idealism and speculative idealism. In chapter two of my book, I lay out Althusser's own criteria for a materialist position on what he calls the effective conditions of the practice that produces knowledge. And these are one, distinction between the real and its knowledge. Two, correspondence, adequacy, between knowledge and its object. And three, Crucially, the primacy of the real over its knowledge or the primacy of being over thought. Those are Althusser's three criteria. Now, this is a lucid and precise articulation of conditions above all because it defines materialism without recourse to any definition of matter. The primacy of being over thought of the real over knowledge of the real means that being is not contained by thinking nor coextensive with it. And I should say that for this reason, I do not reject the distinction between the for us and the in itself, as Julia mentioned. I merely try to clarify what can and cannot be understood by the term in itself. Um, being exceeds and is prior to thought. Thinking emerges within being. It is itself the result of a material genesis, which it can think about, but to which it is neither identical nor coextensive. Thus, there is a distinction between the real and knowledge of the real. Knowledge of the real is part of the real. 
it is not identical with it. And this distinction must be acknowledged in accordance with the key criterion of materialism, the primacy of being over thought. Yet within the terms of this distinction between the real and knowledge and the primacy of being over thought, there must also be a correspondence between knowledge and its object. The materialist must be able to hold at once that thinking and being are distinct and that we can establish an adequate knowledge of objects. Adequate not only insofar as they correspond with the categories of our co cognition, but insofar as our knowledge of objects corresponds with and refers to properties of objects understood as existing in distinction from our categories of cognition. Knowledge must be adequate to objects without being identical to the real. Thinking must be adequate to being without an identity of thinking and being. This is the problem. These are Althusser's materialist criteria, which I aim to uphold. Now, why must one be a rationalist empiricist in order also to be a rationalist materialist? Because empiricism is the name of the philosophical orientation toward an encounter with exteriority. And reference to such exteriority is required to sustain the distinction between knowledge and its object and the primacy of being over thought. Crucially, it's this commitment to the encounter of thinking and knowing with what is exterior to them that distinguishes rationalist empiricism from speculative idealism. It distinguishes what Mayasu calls speculative materialism from speculative idealism. And it also distinguishes what I call speculative critique from transcendental critique. Well, I do not aim to displace the pivotal role of imagination in Descartes' wax experiment. Studying a piece of wax as it melts is not the same as measuring the Planck constant through reference to a kilogram prototype using a watt balance apparatus. Um, that's the subject of, uh, I guess, what is it? Chapter six of my book. Um, so I do indeed offer an account of empiricism that goes beyond the transcendental receptivity and categorical determination of objects theorized by Kant. I write, by, by empiricism, I refer to a philosophical orientation claiming the genesis of ideas and experience and grounding the determination of what is the case on the consistency of thinking with experiential fact. Now, what's pivotal here is reference to what is the case. Reason is concerned with what must be the case, what should be the case, and what may be the case. However, rationalism on its own is unable to grapple with what is the case, with facts, with what happens to be the case, and with the determination of objects of experience. This is why Kant offers a transcendental theory of the conditions of all possible experience, of cognitive conditions for the determination of objects. And if one is not to fall back into transcendental philosophy, conceding the identity of knowledge of objects with objects of knowledge, one must be able to give an account of how knowledge may be adequate to objects of experience without dissolving the distinction between knowledge of the object and the object that is known. Thus, I follow Bachelard in emphasizing the technological and experimental constitution of scientific knowledge of objects, which distinguishes such knowledge from phenomenal immediacy by filtering out the categorical constitution of objects by subjective faculties. The importance of scientific instruments is that they do not share the forms of receptivity nor the categorical determinations of our subjective faculties. And they are thus essential for filtering phenomenal givenness out of experimental encounters with objects and relations that are indeed exterior to our cognition. Now, Bachelard's theory of scientific knowledge is both rationalist and empiricist. He emphasizes the constant shuttling back and forth in scientific practice between mathematical equations, technical formalizations, and experimental procedures, such that formalisms through which physical theory is expressed are tested against and informed by empirical irregularities and experimental results. Precise experiments are made possible, on the other hand, by the present state of physical theory, its mathematical formalization, and by the technical historical configuration of apparatuses. Grasping this movement between rationalism and empiricism, holding these apart while coordinating their discrepant powers, is what enables a materialist approach to science, one that acknowledges the distinction between knowledge and the object of knowledge, while also establishing the adequacy of knowledge to objects. Such a theory, I think, cannot be provided by a rationalism that does not grapple with the empirical dimension of scientific practice, with the experimental testing of physical theory, and with the revision of scientific theory that experiment makes possible. <clears throat> 
Again, scientific knowledge undergoes transformations precisely when anomalous phenomena, phenomena put pressure upon equations and formulas. And also when equations and formalisms put pressure upon what had be cons been considered empirically self-evident. It takes both of these elements of theory and practice to make science rigorous enough to be revisable and revisable enough to be rigorous. Consider this materialist criterion with respect to Nick's appeal to Spinoza, um, that thinking substance and extended substance are one and the same substance. Unfortunately for the Spinozist who would be a materialist, that is an idealist position. Uh, thinking is not separable from extension, but extension is indeed separable from thinking. Spinoza's position denies the primacy of being over thought, and it denies what Althusser calls the distinction between the real and its knowledge. In fact, the identity of thinking and being is the very ground of Spinoza's identification of God and nature. And while this is often read as the core of his materialism, it makes adequate knowledge of nature conditional upon the identity of thinking and extended substance as one and the same substance. That's a proposition that I think the materialist must reject. If the question is how Althusser's materialism is to be understood, I don't think the materialist criteria outlined uh, in the 1966 essay can be written off as an instance of theoretical weakness or compromise. They're clearly legible in On the Materialist Dialectic, and they're essential also to the lecture course for scientists and also to Lenin and philosophy. These criteria, I argue, cannot be met by a Spinoza's position on the relation between thinking and substance, thinking substance and extended substance, because that position doesn't acknowledge the priority of being to thought and thus the exteriority of being to thinking substance, even as we think the interiority of thinking substance to being. Right? So these are asymmetrical. Nick mentions that Cavaillaz, quote, calls for a notion of mathematics and scientific development more generally that follows the internal development of its concepts rather than a dualist model of the adequation of an empirical object to its mathematical formalization. I think there are two problems here. So first, scientific development more generally cannot be modeled on the development of pure mathematics. If materialists do not provide an account of the experimental practices of science, idealists will do it for them. But pure mathematics lacks this experimental dimension of scientific practice. Of course, experiments are enabled and suffused with concepts, but they're also capable of delivering results that change those concepts, that enable their revision through the exposure of concepts to what is outside them um, and outside the security of their internal development. Secondly, Nick offers a critique of dualism that I think is itself dualistic. Um, dualism is not necessarily a bad word for me, but I think the critique of dualism here is dualistic. Um, the internal development of concepts cannot be entirely separated from the adequation of an empirical object to its mathematical formalization. Scientific concepts, theoretical physics, frequently run ahead of experimental results. Um, but they can't be entirely severed from them. And these results must be capable of putting pressure upon scientific knowledge and forcing its revision. So that's why the Large Hadron Collider exists. Um, rationalist empiricism is materialist insofar as it accounts for the, this exposure of concepts to their outside, which is also necessary for the internal development of these concepts, uh, as is the case in the experimental sciences. In a different register, um, an account with that which is exterior to formalization is at the core of Badiou's theory of the event. The event is an exception insofar as it is that which is not being. It cannot be included within the theoretical field of ontology developed by mathematical set theory. That's why the book is called Being and Event. Something happens and the subject stems from fidelity to what has taken place, naming of it and commitment to it an assertion that it has taken place which is outside the norms of experience. But an event cannot be collapsed into the truth which that subject produces. A procedure intervenes between event and truth, wherein a series of encounters is decided uh, upon according to a criteria of fidelity. Again, a shuttling back and forth between the rationality of the ought and encounters with the facticity of what is, of what happens. 
The subject must traverse the field of these encounters in order to draw them into the field of the truth constructed from an event. Um, and here I'm close to wrapping up. And it's certainly true, as Nick insists, that Marx demonstrates the systematic necessity that governs every category of the capitalist social form, including its superficial forms of appearance. But in my chapter on Marx, I try to account for the role of the historical chapters of Das Kapital in this demonstration. Um, and I do not consider them merely supplementary. Um, yes, Marx writes capital sitting in the British library rather than by carrying out field work, but as Nick also acknowledges, he isn't just reading theories of political economy. His critique of political economy is suffused with, with historical research into the development of capitalism, the transformation of the labor process and of the class relation through its history. Here are the census figures, the quantification of windmills and horsepower, uh, references to reports of inspectors of factories, public health reports, children's employment commissions, uh, death rates in different industries, how many employees do or do not fall within the sphere of the British Factory Act, etc. My point is not that Marx's massive assimilation of historical facts enables him to write capital. Um, rather, my point is that capital includes this material and we need to understand why without marginalizing it. In my account, it's because Marx understands capitalism from primitive accumulation to the division of labor, to real subsumption, to the rising organic composition of capital and the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, the tendential production of surplus populations. He understands all of that as a process of separation. He maps this process as it affects both the labor process and the valorization process. The labor process and the valorization process have to be distinguished in order to understand their relation, uh, as Marx is the first to do. He produces an empirical account of the primitive accumulation of capital and of the division of labor as the constitution of the class relation and as the transformation of the labor process that attend respectively formal subsumption and real subsumption. His system of concepts allows us to understand why there must be a deepening division of labor to expand surplus labor time. But his description of the transformation of the labor process enables us to understand how the continuing accumulation of capital is enabled by the division of labor. We cannot and should not, I think, ignore the empirical dimensions of Marx's theory, which are just as integral to the development of his concepts as his concepts are to the understanding of historical phenomena. And to try to answer Nick's question, um, which I appreciate because perhaps it's not clear in the chapter. Um, this is how separation operates as a concept and a method gleaned from Marx's account of the history of capital. That is, his account holds apart the labor process and the valorization process in order to show how they intersect without being identical. Since value is not produced by labor, but by socially necessary labor time, and since we cannot understand how the production of surplus value through surplus labor time is expanded without understanding the difference of the labor process from the valorization process and how each is transformed by the other. So the separation of labor and value produces what Marx calls a system of all round material dependence, which is capitalism. Taken up from a critical perspective, separation is thus both historical process to be analyzed and dialectical method of analysis, which allows us to parse the separation and holding together of labor and accumulation. Um, it's an analytical method produced and theorized as the systematicity of capital separations. In order to separate what it also holds together as an imminent critique of capital, that method requires um, both a disjunction between and coordination of the rational and the empirical. And just a final remark. Um, I just note that in one of these uh, papers, the critique, which I appreciate, is that the project is too rationalist. And in the other case, the critique is that the project is too empiricist. Um, and so this, I think, is, a, is an interesting conjunction of uh, these two responses and maybe enables us to, to open up more critical questions from both of those uh, positions. So thanks again so much.
Okay, so at uh, at this time, um, we can open things up to uh, to questions, and um, uh, I just want to say that um, the questions don't have to concern only the topics that were brought up in the responses. I think um, Nathan can take questions about the book uh, more generally if you're if you're wondering about uh, other things. So I think probably the easiest way is. Um, I think we're, we're right around the numbers where uh, it's you know either the, the hand raise function or just type question into the chat and I'll just kind of try to keep my eye out for it, okay? I also just wanna say quickly that I think we'll, we'll also have even more time for questions after the second panel and so you know, I want there to be exchange also with the two with the two respondents. Um, and within the 30 minutes, we're going to be a little constrained, but I'm happy to take, you know, questions from anyone, including respondents. And then maybe we can also try to work out um, disagreements and questions, you know, in, um, in the aftermath of the second panel. Well, Nathan, maybe I can actually start out with something. Um, and uh, this is actually, um, I have a question concerning um, what I referred to, I guess, in my introduction as your intervention in the history of philosophy. And uh, I guess as I was reading your book, I mean, I was thinking about how the history of philosophy has, you know, at different points in its history been rethought. I mean, how it becomes a philosophical problem in its own right. And um, an example of this, I guess, would be, um, you know, as, as you're familiar with, would be Kant's own isolation of rationalism and empiricism as particular methodologies so as to prepare for his critical intervention. Uh, and my question uh, has to do with the way that your own work, I guess, kind of rethinks the, the history of philosophy or the way that the history of philosophy has been done. And specifically, I'm wondering about your reading of the movement from, you know, Kant to Hegel you know, and then to Marx. And I think that one way that this tends to be read is in terms of um, this kind of increasing primacy of the practical, uh, which then allows us to think through not only the movement, you know, from Kant through Schiller to Hegel, but also in a different way from Kant through Schiller to the Romantics. And I think that the one way uh, this, you know, tends to be described, how it tends to be narrativized is in terms of uh, this, you know, sort of gradual emphasis on, you know, freedom in particular becomes this kind of master concept. And I guess I was wondering just since you're working over some of the same material and then, and so kind of, again, you know, kind of rethinking this, this history, I mean, you know, kind of telling this, this history differently. I mean, does this privileging of the practical and this, you know, insistence on freedom have any role to play in what you're describing? Or do these terms sort of drop out in favor of, of other ones? Um, yeah, great question. So I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. So I think for one thing, I mean, this is very much itself, uh, I consider a historical project in the, in the sense of a conjunctural project. That is to say, it's motivated by a critique of, of Kant, you know, that let's say many of us encountered and felt that we had to deal with in one way or another in the early 21st century, the first decade of the 21st century. And many of those critiques are, are quite vulgar. Some of them are more compelling, um, but you know, I was attentive to the fact that in addition to those critiques, you know, we have very important critiques of, of Kant by Hegel and of Heidegger. Um, and I wanted to think about these contemporary critiques also within that context as I, as I try to do at different moments in the book. Um, and I think that, so you're asking specifically about, and, and so the question for me is if there's to be a critique of Kant, if we take seriously, for example, Hegel's critique of Kant, and if we want to displace transcendental critique in favor of what Hegel calls imminent critique um, or true critique, um, then we have to think through, this is my argument, the reopening of Kant's displacement of the opposition between rationalism and empiricism. And this is why I want to insist that I'm not calling for a return to a pre-Kantian framework, but rather one that takes seriously the, uh, the critique of transcendental critique by imminent critique. And, um, and that's, what I would, that's where I would situate the core of the difference between Hegel and Kant, and also Marx and Kant, is the development of an imminent 
a method of imminent critique. Um, and not so much the primacy of the practical, because of course there is a certain primacy of the practical in Kant as well. It's not as though the practical is not important for Kant, he simply has a different idea of it. Um, now Kant has a, a theory of freedom and a morality, which I take extremely seriously. Um, at the same time, Hegel and Marx developed, let's say, historically mediated accounts of subjective determination and of historical determination that I also take extremely seriously. And so, you know, I would just say that um, the method of imminent critique rather than tr transcendental critique is indispensable to adding an account of historical determination um, into an account of practical reason. And, and that's, what I, that's what I think is the core of the sequence running from, uh, from Kant to Hegel to Marx. I could say more, but I, I wanna try to be brief. Yeah, thanks so much. And then uh, I think uh, Nick has a question and then uh, Matt. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Nathan, thanks for your, your, your considered response. And there were a lot of points I, I uh, took on and, and I wanna, think more about particularly your ideas about the, the dualism of my argument. But I wanted to ask you about um, something that I don't think has come up much yet, which is the place of politics yep. in the book. And maybe I can do that by, by also taking on your point about these three, I agree, these three um, uh, productive and, 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 and powerful criteria of materialism in the in the 66 Alter 66 essay and particularly your, your focus on the primacy of the real and I think that so you read that as as um, a certain if I hear you right a certain invocation of a certain empiricism but I think there's for me there's another way of taking that on which is what I see as the way by Jew has has moved uh, uh, where in being an event, there's a displacement or a critique of his own earlier logicism uh, and, and uh, the, the, the initial critique of Frege and <clears throat> the way that he, uh, logic in relation to ontology merely becomes what's sayable of being rather than having any, uh, in, in the context of there is no set of all sets, there is no totality given that uh, then there is no total logic uh, uh, such that logic doesn't govern ontology, but rather is merely what's sayable of it. But then, you would, so you would think, okay, uh, uh, that, that's all he has to say about logic. But then there's logics of worlds where there's a second displacement of logic, which is toward what he calls the, in this productive way, the science of appearances. And so my, my claim is that that's, that's a really interesting way, I think, to read Capital, even though the book itself and capitalism doesn't ever come up in its 600 pages. But I think getting to my question about politics, you, uh, for, in, in a different place, I think where you're talking about Badiou and Spinoza and Althusser, you're, you're making that critique of, of Althusser's reliance on Spinoza along the lines you you, you, you re-invoked here um, and uh, uh, for contingency against necessity. But I think there's, there's a, a also a certain polit way of, of reading a politics of, of necessity. Obviously that's Cavaillesse's uh, 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 orientation as, a, uh, as his investment in the resistance, et cetera, as a, explicitly he says a Spinozist, he says, I'm a Spinozist and, Necessity also governs our political work in the resistance. But for me, I think of something like CLR James's Black Jacobins, which is to say, not just a, a, a logic of the necessity of a social form, say capitalism for Marx, but also a logic of the necessity of an event, of a revolutionary event. So not contingency, but rather rather necessity. And, and I read Black Jacobins, for example, as uh, in fact, a sort of phenomenological empirical investigation of what are the criteria of uh, the necessary criteria governing a successful revolution, 
right? The Russian Revolution for the other book, Re World Revolution, Black Jacobins, the criteria for the Haitian Revolution. I think that it's also possible to think in these terms the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and in relation to the primacy of the real, a logic not just of, 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 of a given world of an ontology, but also of the event and the logic of an event. So anyway, let me stop there and, 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 and uh, just ask you about politics. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Well, well, first of all, you know, I think that this, uh, that this idea that you have for, for reading um, Capital through Logique des Mondes, you know, I think this is quite interesting and I really uh, look forward to seeing how that, how that works out. Because um, I do think obviously the logic of appearing is, is, is crucial. Um, uh, I don't at all, I don't at all, as I try to emphasize um, at the beginning of my response also, uh, want to surrender any criterion of necessity. So I try to preserve the rationalist criterion of necessity, as does a thinker like Mayasu. The entire point of his ontology, of his ontological claim, is that what has to be said to be necessary is contingency itself. And it is the only thing that has to be said to be necessary. But the question is, what must be said? And I would also take up the, um, uh, that at the level of what must be done. So in, in Badiou's theory, there is an exception to the sort of inertia of the historical field, which he calls the event. But the question that it begs in the future anterior is if there will have been a truth constructed from this event, what must be done? But the important thing is that question has to be posed of every term, as he puts it, or every point in Logique des Mondes encountered within the sequence of the procedure. And that means there have to be real encounters that are unexpected, that are decided upon one by one, that can't be formalized in advance, and that you can't give a general answer to the question, what must be done or what is to be done. There, there has to be the contingency of those encounters which are then decided upon. But at every moment of that decision, after Kant, you know, also we can say, what is it that I must do given that? I've taken up fidelity to the event and the attempt to construct a truth out of it in Baudu's terms. But I would also say that, you know, I also want to point here to um, uh, the Marxist criterion of the primacy of practice in Althusser, Marx himself, and in Thierry Communiste, and say that, you know, Thierry Communiste is so important in, uh, in chapter nine of the book um, because they try to think through what they call the theorizing character of struggles. And they develop a practice over 40 years of like analyzing particular political struggles as they take place. And um, they're also, you know, stringently conceptual, formalist, abstract thinkers. I mean, you know, the work is extremely difficult. Um, but what the point of that is that there's a changing structure of the class relation. And therefore, it, changing sort of criteria or um, a, a changing field of class struggle that has to be thought through again as it unfold, unfolds historically. And the minutia of that, it, you know, takes place in concrete struggles as they unfold. And so they try to draw from structural, you know, analyses of those struggles and, and conclusions that can contribute to the theoretical field. And so again, that moving back and forth there, I think is absolutely crucial in their, in their theoretical um, labor. Uh, so I guess that's, the best I can do with, with the time that we have. But I, I definitely look forward to talking more about these things. Um, now I think we have uh, Matt and then Mike. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Nathan, for, for your talk and for sharing your work. Um, I have a maybe somewhat more literary question. Um, and I think, I think it's a question about style. Um, we'll see, maybe it's two different questions, um, but you know, I confess I haven't gotten to all of, all of your book yet. I was just reading some parts of it last night and found it super interesting and some of what has been discussed came up. So feel free to, if, if I'm asking a very myopic question because I just haven't gotten to something, feel free to, to tell me to, to go read a, a different chapter that I haven't maybe gotten to. But um, so the question is about um, the difference between um, well, you put it on page 240 of your book, uh, you know, the chapter on uh, capital, the difference between what is studied and the way it is studied. I hear you're talking about how separation is both what is studied and um, the way it is studied. And then you say that the, the process of separation is what Marx discovers in the history of modernity, 
and it is the method of critique he applies to his discovery. It is historical dialectic mobilized as imminent critique. So we've been talking about some of this stuff, some of the past few questions about imminent critique and about what exactly it was that Marx was studying in the British Library. You know, you have the point about discovery here. Um, so I guess the first part of the question is, you know, is imminent critique applying what, simply what one sees or is there a difference? And I, I'm asking this in part because I'm thinking of the, the moment in Marx's post face to the second edition, right? That where he says that there is a necessary difference between the inquiry and the presentation. And I was wondering if that conflicted with what you're saying here, although I went back and I just called it up on uh, my computer and I looked through it and it seems like maybe it's actually confirming what you're saying in a way, maybe Marx is actually um, integrating or for lack of a better term, I guess it's not quite what you're going for, the, the empirical and the rational or holding them in the balance that you're looking for, the conceptual and the um, practical, for lack of a better word. And then the reason I, I thought of it as a question maybe of style was going back to, because I think of that moment as Marx may be talking about his style in, in Capital. And going back to your introduction, you have you just had a kind of a, an amusing point I thought about Mayasu and what you find so interesting Mayasu, and this could be completely different, but it just seemed possibly homologous in some way that what you what you liked about um, after finitude was the way was the book's method, but you didn't mean specifically style there, and you talk a little bit about why you, it wasn't style that you preferred. So I was just wondering if if it's style, why can't style be a way of doing what what you're after, and um, and if that you know style has a relation to imminent critique or if what Marx is going for was maybe undercutting some of what you're going for, or maybe that's exactly what you were going for. So sorry, it's a bit of a convoluted question, but. Great. Um, so in the case of, of Mayasu, you know, the point I make in the introduction, I don't mean to say that I don't, that I don't care about his style or I don't think it's important. It's, it's just that many people have, have made the remark, you know, that, that he deploys this sort of, uh, classical, you know, almost 18th century style of like, of prose and, and, of, and of thinking um, to these sort of uh, quite counterintuitive, you know, philosophical conclusions. And so all I was trying to say there is like, I'm not just saying that again, but what interests me is, is method. Um, you know, the, so not, not that I'm not interested in style, but what interests me in this context is method, you know, because it's that, it's that sort of strange, like being both a rationalist and empiricist, the reference to both Descartes and Hume as constitutive of his philosophical project that, uh, that struck me and that I wanted to think through. In Marx, it's also, it's also method that I think is an issue. I, I, I definitely am not saying that, um, and this would be the point, you know, of, you know the, the importance of Nick's emphasis on the development of, of concepts that are adequate to, let's say, the displacement of just the immediacy of experience. You know, so one can't just point at what is there, you know, capitalism, and um, and say that's that. You know, and and the, so the key thing here for thinking about what I'm calling the analytic of separation and the relationship between how capitalism works and the structure of modernity, the transformation of um, the labor process and also the valorization process over the history of capital, one has to know what that looks like. Um, but at the same time, you know, I call it an analytic of separation because if you just point at what's there, then you think that the value of a commodity consists in its materials or the labor that went into it at this sort of concrete level. And you don't make the levels of abstraction to recognize that it's socially necessary labor time on average that determines the value of a commodity or of a commodity line, and that it's the extraction of, of surplus value that operates through um, surplus labor time. So those are levels of abstraction that you can't reach just by pointing at what's there. But the, but the key element of, of separation as a concept is that what is there is the separation of labor and capital. That's, and the production of that separation is the history of primitive accumulation. And it's also the continuing history of the division of labor. Um, which transforms the valorization process itself. So one has to understand um, empirically, you know, the process of 
primitive accumulation, the process of the division of labor that the Marx calls a Scheidungsprozess, you know, a, a process of separation, but one also has to develop concepts adequate to analyzing it. But I'm saying there's a dialectic between the historical process of separation and the analytic of separation that Marx develops. Um, and, and to get that, one has to move between, again, those, those two different elements without surrendering either of them. So I think uh, Mike, and it's wonderful to see you, has a, a question. Yeah, it's good to see everyone. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Nathan. Um, I, I haven't read the book. I only heard about it for the first time on Monday. So not for the first time I'm engaging irresponsibly in a seminar. Um, but my question is about how you understand the necessity of rationalist uh, empiricism. Um, this is a good Kantian question in a way, because we have to be clear about exactly in what way we must be rationalist empiricists. One way in which that can be true would be that everyone is a rationalist em empiricist, whether they recognize it or not. And you are simply clarifying the, re the reality of what Kant uh, who, or whoever, whoever else has been doing all along. And they, it's a matter of misrecognition on their part to think that they're not rationalist empiricists, but they're in fact transcendental idealists, for example. Uh, and another uh, form of the necessity would be that if you fail to be a rationalist empiricist, if you don't take up the method and apply it properly, then, then you'll misunderstand something or act improperly in, in, in one, one way or another. And as so I want, want you to say a little bit about, uh, about how you understand this, it seems to me that as a reasonable claim to be made for the first one, uh, you know, sitting here thinking about Kant and, um, and looking at the ways in which Kant tries to um, use a, a, a rationalist or an a priori approach to coordinate <clears throat> uh, or to orient an empirical engagement with the world, but then never ends up sort of finally uh, being synthesized with, with, with the empirical manifold that, um, that provides for empirical knowledge. Uh, is seen, I think, for in his engagement with the empirical natural sciences of every kind except for Newtonian mechanics. If you see him looking uh, at the chemistry of the 1790s, if you see him looking at the life sciences of the, seven, uh, the second half of the 18th century, he's constantly being pulled back and forth between, on the one hand, uh, the a priori demands of reason, and on the other hand, uh, the innovative successes of, uh, of empirical research. And he's constantly, he's regularly trying to bring them together and, and, and fails over and over again to do that. Um, so it seems to me that, that could be the, the rudiments to, for an explanation of, 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 of the claim or the defense of the claim that, that Kant was, despite himself, a rationalist empiricist. Um, and so I wonder sort of how you think about that. And, and, and as I said, how you think about the necessity of the position more, more generally. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And I, and I think I'm starting to realize that um, perhaps because I pull a lot of different philosophers together in, in the book, um, the question does come up like, oh, is, is everybody a rationalist empiricist? Is this just some way of describing, you know, from a certain perspective, just what happens in philosophy that then is maybe voided of significance? Um, and I want to insist that um, although I'm, I'm talking about a lot of different philosophical projects, it's a very particular um, constellation of thinkers. So um, as somebody asked at, the, at my book launch a couple of weeks ago, what is not who is not a rationalist empiricist? What is not rationalist empiricism? Well, so my account is transcendental philosophy is not rationalist empiricism, and I'll say why in a second. Um, phenomenology is not rationalist empiricism, um, nor are someone like Spinoza. Spinoza is just a rationalist. He's not a rationalist empiricism. Hume is just an empiricist. He's not a rationalist empiricist, and that's why when he produces this weird rationalist exception, he has to say, ah, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Here's something that supposedly contradicts my theory, and here it is, you know? Um, so Hume is just an empiricist. Spinoza is just a rationalist. Deleuze is a transcendental empiricist, not a rationalist empiricist. I would make the distinction. Why? Because it's about the conditions of real experience. And the conditions, so this reference to, to um, framing conditions, either of possible experience or even of real experience, as Deleuze puts it. My point is that what this does, and the same is true of phenomenology, is it forecloses the encounter with exteriority, which is crucial to the empiricist pole of rationalist empiricism, is what I'm trying to say to Nick. So although Kant, of course, may be doing all kinds of empirical research, and he, of course, is doing a lot of reasoning, um, his framing of the philosophical field and of critique 
right, imposes conditions of possibility, um, which do not allow, let's say, for the encounter with exteriority, except as it is, you know, filtered through um, uh, forms of intuition and concepts of the understanding, the synthesis of imagination, in a way that um, that uh, that frames the possibility of experience as internal to the conditions of knowledge proper to a subject. So, in my account of science, you know, I'm trying to emphasize the way in which that kind of phenomenal immediacy is filtered out, um, and so. So I would just say that what the criterion for rationalist empiricism is a holding apart. So what Kant does is displaces the opposition between them in order to synthesize um, conditions of receptivity and of cognitive determination through transcendental philosophy. And it's that synthesis that I think has to be rendered historical, retroactive. There has to be a capacity for reason and experience to interrupt one another. Um, while still participating in the construction of knowledge. Um, and so transcendental synthesis is the operation that I'm, that I'm trying to displace. And that's why it's the critique of transcendental philosophy, not the critique of critique, but the critique of transcendental critique, which motivates the project. The question is then what becomes of the fate of these philosophical methods that Kant had displaced through the synthetic framing of transcendental conditions of possibility. And the argument is that it opens up in, in, um, in, he in Hegel's method of imminent critique, a dialectical movement between what happens in thought and what has to be said of it. Um, in Marx, a dialectical movement between history and concept. Um, and, uh, and in science, a dialectical movement between, between theory and practice, where of course you have to have a framing of concepts to analyze theory, but you also have to have an exposure to the exteriority of, um, of experience to transcendental conditions of possibility uh, for the construction of knowledge to be interrupted. Um, so that's the, that's the argument. And I think um, uh, Petar actually has a question in the, uh, in the chat, and I think that's, it was sent to everyone, right? You can, uh, I can, I can read it quickly and then Nathan can respond, should probably be the last. Uh, question. Uh, encounter with exteriority, can you please explain this in a bit more detail? First, in what terms does this encounter take place? What makes it an encounter? Uh, do we know, uh, how do we know it takes place? Uh, this is just a basic question seeking clarification. Yeah. So here's, a, here's an example, um, and, and this would go back to, uh, to Julia's um, response. What's the, what's the difference between my analysis of the wax experiment and the way in which Husserl, let's say, replaces the wax with multi-sided dye. The claim there is that, first of all, the object is replaceable. It is replaceable because the transcendental epoche, um, the suspension precisely of exteriority to intentionality, that's what's suspended, um, constructs a field of the knowledge of the object um, wherein, of course, we can have an analysis of the temporal unfolding of the object in time. But why is it that Descartes calls the wax experiment uh, an exception? Why is it that he designates as something that he's going to do just this once? So basically, Michel Henri, you know, doesn't believe him. <laughs> and he says, actually, nothing happens. The wax experiment unfolds entirely within um, conditions of reduction. So his argument is there is no exception. Nothing really happens except the same kind of analysis of, of knowledge of bodies um, without the specificity of this body being analyzed. That's what, um, that's what Henri says. But what happens in the wax experiment? Actually, the wax experiment is incredibly beautiful. And this is why the relay, in fact, between imagination and, and concept in the mode of the Kantian analytic of the beautiful is important. Here's what I would say. Actually, what Descartes says he experiences is the advent of something that I analyze as parallel to the sublime, the way in which the imagination is inadequate to the sort of infinite alterations of, um, of the transformation of the object as it unfolds, such that it has to be like thought, let's say, by reason. It's an analogy with the, the Kantian sublime. 
but what we experience, I would say, when we read the wax experiment is the beautiful. Why? Because of the particularity of the object. It's because in fact of the singularity of the object for the wax was not the sweetness of the honey. That's beautiful. Why is it beautiful? Because the wax is not a multi-sided dye. It cannot just be exchanged for any object in general as the correlate of an intentional analysis. Actually, it punctures the general status of objects through the singularity of what it was before it was melted and what it is not now. And there's something actually profoundly elegiac about the wax experiment. For the wax was not the sweetness of the honey nor the blueness, of et cetera. You know, this gorgeous description which takes time. And there's, a, there's something that happens where determining judgment, I would say, is interrupted by reflective judgment. Um, and it's, uh, Descartes tries to recover the capacity of reason precisely in the mode of the Kantian sublime to think beyond you know, the failure of synthesis. Um, but when we read the wax experiment, and I would say that Descartes' writing of the wax experiment also indicates that it's possible to relate to it through the singularity of the object and the element of, of the beautiful. So that's the encounter with exteriority. What does that mean? It means the way in which the, the, the object is not reducible to general conditions of knowledge of an object. Of course, you know, of course it's the case, as the phenomenologist always points out, and as the transcendental philosopher always points out in a different way, that the existence of life and thought are conditions of possibility for there to be meaning. But that does not suffice to determine the meaning of any particular statement or question or practice. And indeed, the meaning of certain statements or questions or practices may depend upon reference to the exteriority of being and meaning, precisely because neither life nor thought are conditions of possibility for being. It's that exteriority of being to thought and the inclusion of thinking within the field of being, the asymmetry of that relation, which is what I mean by exteriority. And I think there can be an advent within experience of that asymmetry. And that's what I'm trying to to get at and to think through. Great. So thanks so much uh, to Nathan. And I want to thank uh, all of our respondents. And, uh, and a reminder that um, we're reconvening at uh, 3 p.m. for responses from uh, Tracy McNulty and Alexei Kukulyevich. And uh, the Q&A there, if there are questions left over, um, we can also you know, continue with, with these discussions. So um, again, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Hey Rob, is is that in one hour? Uh, yes. Sorry, I'm like it's seven p.m. No, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no idea. It's in okay. one hour. Yes, yes. All right. Okay, cool. And Rob is like just exactly at three. Fine, or did you want it open again slightly uh, early? You wanna, what do you want to do? Like like five minutes ahead yeah, this time. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Cool. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Okay. Thanks, Rob. I'm on. I'm on. Prague time here too. So, so one in one hour from now. One hour. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Great. All right. Cheers. Oh, Julia, do you want me to keep it? Um, did you want me to keep this thing open or anything? I can just assign, make you a host. But I, uh, otherwise, if I, when I leave, it's all going to shut down. Oh, I see. Um, I don't know. I was just gonna, I was just gonna turn my camera off, but then everybody, I think all these other people are here. That's fine. I'll just do the same. I can, yeah, I think it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. I gotta see, yeah, I gotta see about what to do about dinner. Okay. Yeah. I'll just, I'll shut off my, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see ya. Nice to see ya.